Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, we're going to be covering different types of genetic inheritance, so things like autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked recessive, mitochondrial, as well as a handful of other genetic concepts and terms. This is the third video in my series of seven videos covering genetic. Specifically, I'd like to point out the next video in the series, which is going to cover pedigrees and the visual representation of ancestry of specific diseases. That video is going to tie in really well with this one, and they're sort of a combo, so I suggest watching that right after this one. At any particular gene locus, you have a version from your mom and a version from your dad. Usually both versions are not expressed, and only one of the genes affects the phenotype, or the observable characteristics. The gene that is expressed over another allele of the same type is called dominant. Individuals appear to have the phenotype of the dominant gene, whether they have two copies of that dominant allele, which would be homozygous, or heterozygous, have only one dominant allele. So the person appears to have the phenotype of the dominant allele, whether they have one or two copies of that allele. The allele that does not affect the phenotype when a dominant allele is present is called recessive. Recessive alleles only change the phenotype when there is no dominant allele present. Heterozygous individuals would have one dominant and one recessive, and like I already mentioned, they would show the phenotype of the dominant gene. However, these heterozygous individuals that have one of the recessive genes are considered carriers for that recessive gene. They themselves won't show the phenotype of the recessive gene, but they can pass it on to their offspring. An exception to this system would be codominance, which we would most often see in the inheritance for different blood types. In that case, you can have two different genes both be dominant at the same time. That's why you can have type A and type B blood together. When we're covering dominant versus recessive alleles, it's often shown in a Punnett square with the dominant allele being given the capital letter and the recessive allele being given the lowercase letter. Therefore, a heterozygous, who is a carrier for the recessive gene, would be represented with a capital letter and a lowercase letter for each of the two alleles they have. You can see here what the classic example of brown eyes versus blue eyes. And brown eyes is dominant and blue eyes is recessive. So here the capital B would be for brown eyes and the lowercase b would be for blue eyes. And on the left hand we have both the alleles from the father and then on the top we have both the alleles from the mother. And then in the four boxes in white here you can see the four different possibilities you would have by recombining the different alleles from the parents. Each of these four possibilities is equally likely to occur. And you can see any of these combination sets highlighted in brown text is going to end up with brown eyes and any highlighted in blue text is going to have blue eyes. And you can see that 50% of the children on average are going to have brown eyes and they're going to be heterozygous. And they're going to be heterozygous for brown eyes. And 50% of the time they're going to be blue eyes with two of the recessive alleles together. Obviously if the couple has four children, they might not get exactly two with blue eyes and two with brown eyes, but if they were to have a thousand children, then you'd have about 50%, as probability and chance would play less of a role. If both parents were brown-eyed heterozygous individuals, then you would only have a 25% chance of having a blue-eyed child, and 75% of the time they would have brown-eyed children, with 25% of the time being homozygous brown eye and 50% of the time being heterozygous brown eye. Even if the mother is homozygous blue eye, all of the children will be brown eyed if the father is homozygous brown eye. And 100% of the children are going to be brown eyes with heterozygous for each gene. And you can see here I give the autosomal dominant type of inheritance a high yield rating of 4. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a rating scale from 0 to 10, giving you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for step 1. And if you want to find out more details about the high yield rating, you can go to my website here and check that out. Now that we've reviewed recessive and dominant, we can talk about autosomal dominant diseases. 
these are diseases that are inherited in a dominant fashion and the gene that causes this disease is on one of the chromosomes other than X and Y. So the autosome would be all the other 44 chromosomes other than X or Y. There's a long list of diseases with this type of inheritance, but here are a few of the ones that are most commonly asked in these types of questions. Huntington's familial hypercholesterolemia, Marfan syndrome, hereditary spherocytosis, polycystic kidney disease, and you can look up a whole bunch of other ones if you'd like online anywhere. Here's another way to graphically depict autosomal dominant inheritance other than the Punnett square. If you like that, you can pause the video and take a peek at that. Autosomal recessive diseases are the same thing, just the opposite. We're talking about diseases that are inherited on chromosomes other than X and Y that show recessive patterns of inheritance. For whatever reason, they like to ask more questions about the autosomal recessive than autosomal dominant. Cystic fibrosis seems to pop up a lot on these questions, asking what type of inheritance the disease goes through. Most enzyme deficiencies are also going to be autosomal recessive, uh, lysosomal storage diseases, PKU, thalassemia, and again, there's a long list of other diseases that are autosomal recessive. This is just a few of them here. X-linked recessive diseases are the same thing as autosomal recessive diseases, except that the gene that causes the disease is on the X chromosome. That complicates the situation a little bit because males who only have one X are going to get the diseases more often than females who have two X's because a recessive allele on the X chromosome in a male is going to produce the phenotype because there is no other dominant allele present. So while autosomal recessive diseases, you need to receive two copies that are mutated or damaged or have some sort of gene on it. But for males, they can get an X-linked recessive disease with only one affected allele. For females, X-linked recessive is pretty similar to autosomal recessive. It just happens to be on the X chromosome because they still need to receive two affected alleles to get the disease. There's also unique situations to consider, such as males cannot pass an affected X allele onto a son because for a male to have a son, that male has to give the son a Y chromosome. So even if the dad has an X-linked recessive, recessive disease, there's no way for, for that affected allele from the dad to get to a son. He could only pass on that affected X allele to a daughter. Obviously, males are going to be affected a lot more than females in this setup, and women are primarily heterozygous carriers. It's pretty unlikely for them to get the disease, but it can happen as well. They can get two affected X alleles, one from each parent. Here's a small list of diseases with this type of inheritance, muscular dystrophy, hemophilia, G6PD deficiency, and a gamma globinemia. Now I'm going back to the Punnett square for the X and Ys. It's the same thing, but usually you show the X chromosome or the Y chromosome with a superscript for what the gene locus is. So consider here that we're talking about an X-linked recessive disease. So the person highlighted in orange is going to have the disease, and those highlighted in black are going to be fine. So in this case, the father is fine. The mother is also fine, but she's heterozygous. So she's a carrier for that recessive allele on the X chromosome. 100% of the daughters of this couple are going to be normal. Half of those are going to be a carrier, and the other half are going to have two normal alleles. Then when you're looking just at sons, you're going to have 50% normal sons and 50% affected sons who have the recessive genes. Now consider you have a carrier mother, a heterozygous carrier mother, and a dad who is showing the disease. So he has a Y chromosome and one affected X chromosome. In this case, 50% of the daughters are going to be affected. They're going to be homozygous for the affected allele. The other 50% are going to be carriers. 50% of the sons are going to be normal, and the other 50% are going to have the disease. Finally, we can consider a situation where the mom has two normal genes and the dad has the disease. In that case, none of the children are going to end up with the disease. You're going to have 
you're going to have 100% of the daughters be carriers, but nobody's going to have the phenotype of the disease. Again, here's another way to represent X-linked recessive through a picture. If you like this, you can pause the video and take a look here. Now we can cover mitochondrial inheritance. This is a little bit different because now we're talking about genetic material held in the mitochondria that's separate than the regular genetic material held in the chromosomes in the nucleus. The mitochondria have their own separate DNA just for themselves. And this DNA is only inherited through the mother. The father's mitochondrial DNA has no effect on the children. Heteroplasmy would be a situation where you have more than one type of mitochondrial DNA in your body. And most of these situations are going to be when you've inherited one type of mitochondria and then it goes under some type of mutation during your lifespan. The most common or at least highest yield disease with mitochondrial inheritance would be mitochondrial myopathy. And the red flag phrase for this disease would be ragged red fibers on a muscle biopsy. Here is mitochondrial inheritance via picture. You can see that all of the children of an affected mother become affected and none of the children of an affected father become affected. So it's pretty simple. If your mom's got it, you're going to get it. If your dad's got it, it doesn't matter. Now I can go through a few extra genetic terms that are somewhat related to what we've been talking about so far. Polygenic is when the phenotype is not dictated by a single gene. In this case, more than one gene is going to determine the overall phenotype, or there's going to be some interaction between genes and the environment. This is going to be the case with most diseases and most overall types of inheritance. Specifically, like they seem to like to ask questions about cleft lip and palate being polygenic. There's also schizophrenia, epilepsy, baldness, diabetes, hypertension. Most diseases you think about are going to fall into this category. Variable expressivity is when the same genetic defect presents differently in different people. You can have different severities, different organ systems, different signs and symptoms. And a good example of this would be neurofibromatosis, which I'm going to cover in a later video in the genetics section. But some people may have more cutaneous problems. Some people have tumors in different locations. It doesn't present exactly the same with everybody. Mosaicism is when populations of cells within a single individual have different genotypes, different genetic makeup. This is due to post-fertilization changes to those genes. In most cases, it's going to be some sort of chromosomal abnormality caused by improper mitosis. Germline mosaicism is when only gametes, or sperm and eggs, are affected by the genetic defect. Therefore, the individual themselves won't show any signs of having the disease, but they could pass it on to their offspring. Pleiotrophy is when a single genetic defect can affect lots of different parts of the body, multiple organ systems. This is because that gene that's affected is expressed in multiple different organ systems, so one genetic defect can affect multiple parts of the body. Incomplete penetrance is when not everybody with a genetic defect gets the disease. And again, this is going to be common most of the time because incomplete penetrance really means anything other than 100% penetrance, which is pretty rare. Neurofibromatosis is a good example of something with close to 100% penetrance, and Huntington's disease also has a very high penetrance, but most diseases are not going to have anywhere near 100%. Here are a list of here are a list of related topics which I give a high yield rating of zero and have decided not to include in my video to hopefully save you time and help you study more efficiently. If you do choose to study these topics, I would just suggest that you do so after you've already mastered all the higher yield material.